Very good. Got it. I say got it. David says got it. All right. All right. We're we got about. It. All right. You got it. <laughs> Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Barry Landau here. You may know me from my Planet Vermilion, Planet Talansia, and other planets on Facebook. I'm here today with Ken Simpson, the vice president of the La Biona Valley Vermilion Society, and with David Fell, our guest a bromeliad grower and hybridizer extraordinaire. How are you doing, David? Hi, Barry. I'm doing great. It's great to have you here, and uh, I, I envy you for living in Hawaii. And how are you doing, Ken? I'm doing great, and on behalf of the La Bologna Valley Bromeliad Society, thank you for helping prepare this presentation. And David, thank you very much. And as you know, I'm a... a fond of a lot of your plants and have about 30 of them in my collection. So uh, you're the top Varicia grower that I'm aware of and I love your plants, including the one above my left shoulder there. So uh, I'm going to start our presentation of the photos that you have and this is a slide. Let's just start with start with any uh, any one of his, his hybrids. Yeah. Wow. So David, we're going to depend on you to tell us names and anything you feel like telling us about each plant. All right. Well, thanks. Uh, first, I want to start out by thanking you guys for asking me to do this. You know, I finally got off my butt and. Uh, and uh, shot some videos. Uh, this is one of my more recent registrations and uh, I'm a serial procrastinator. So I have a, a, a backlog of plants I had, haven't registered that need to, to be registered. This was one of them and I got off, got, on, got it together and I registered this as Pale Rider this year. This, um, Possibly late last year, I registered it. Very nice variegated plant, medium size, kind of a spreading habit. Uh, seems to be very stable. So nice plant, good grower. Takes uh, for us, it takes the sun or the shade. It's a very nice plant. It took first place in the La Bologna Valley show last month. Let me, I think Kenzin was going to ask you this question later, but I wanted to lead off with something that will give their viewers some idea where you, how you got in. So why do you love the glyph Varesios? How did you get into Varesios? Um, that's an interesting story. Um, the very first bromeliad I ever received was now, a, well, it's now it's Willisia cyanea that my landlord at a nursery I was renting gave me that plant. I got into Varicias after I moved to the Big Island in 1988. And in 1989, I bought a tray of Talansia uh, cyanea seedlings from David Shigi. And in that tray was an escape E. Varicia, a seedling <laughs> that came up in the the cyanea tray. And, uh, and that started me on Varicias. That was my very first Varicia. And, uh, and I had been, a I'd I love growing stuff from seed. And I started growing things from seed because I couldn't afford to buy the plants, but seed was cheap and I could make my own seed. And you were young, you're younger. And, yeah, I was young. <laughs> yeah. Part of the problem with the seed game in Bromeliads is you get maybe three to eight crops in a human lifetime, you know, depending. Some Varesias are pretty quick, but Talansias take forever. Talansias are, take forever. Yeah, Varesias, forever. it takes me uh, about four years from seed set till the first or second culling. You know, I, I sometimes... Yeah will cull in a seedling tray, but usually I wait till they're in four inch pots. And that's about yeah. four years from that's seed. when they start they start to show character, color, yeah. patterning. You, you, uh, 
the first that's when you can get it get some idea but so, only some idea after i'm sorry ken let me just ask one other follow-on question i'll let you ask so it must have been quite a thing to go to shiggy's you know i don't know if our audience knows but david shiggy is the one of the top top vermilion growers in all of hawaii goes back decades and he was one of the early adopters and earlier early growers to uh, hybridize rhizios. Mm -hmm. That's correct. So, so when you went there for that original seedling tray, that must have impressed you to see his stuff. Yeah, he had a lot of very interesting things, but at the time, I wasn't focused at all on rhizios. So, ah. so I, I, I didn't really notice them that much. Gotcha. So my question is, it takes four years to get in the four inch pot. How many more years before they bloom and you pick, you like it and you say, this is what I'm going to register and name? Well, <laughs> I, I have some plants that I made in, uh, I think, 2007 that I haven't registered yet that I'm wow. still evaluating. So I would say uh, usually, you know, from a four inch to a six inch is another year. And six inch, that's when I would make another calling and make more selections and decide what to grow on. And then it's probably another, depending if it's, um, Sometimes I would get seedlings that would show partial variegation, and those take a lot longer because you wait for the variegation to stabilize, and those are sports because you're taking off pups and, and waiting to get at something reasonably stable. If it's a, a uniform seedling, such as this one, this is uh, my chartreuse goose, and that's that's a seedling it's not a sport it's just a hybrid well what's so, what, what's the diameter what's the size of this look you uh, see the feet in the bottom of the picture yeah that gives you some oh, idea about, you're right. you know about 24 inches you know it's not a real big one you know 24 possibly 30 so i would i would put this in my medium category gotcha but it already has a pup right oh yeah yeah, this is a prolific pupper. It pups easily. I, I love the uh, the width of the uh, the margination, or the, it's not margination. It's the album, the lighter colored part of the leaf. Yeah, it has, and this is a nice strong grower too. It's got enough chlorophyll that it grows really well. Yep, yeah, because one of the issues is you're in this rarefied field of well, I know you like as we do, like the variegated plants, but the variegated plants can't be cloned or tissue cultured. So everything is from seed or from pup. It's a slow Basically process. Basically correct. Basically yeah. correct. Yeah. So when you transition I, from like four inch to six inch, are you changing your potting media or? Well, I, I'm one of the, you know, my belief is that you don't mess with the root balls. So I try to take out an intact root ball and just transplant and just new pot, more media. Uh, and that's what I would do, you know, if I'm growing things in pots. I see. Or it, potting. Break, one that's interesting you say uh, that you don't like to uh, disturb a root ball. And also, as we'll see later in your video, you discuss uh, growing plants in a tough manner. And this is exactly the techniques that my mentor, R.M. Delgado, whose friendly name was Frenchy, who was also the 13th unwritten founder of the Vermilion Society International. Frenchy, who this is circa 1972, I befriended him, and he was 65 and I was 11, and we were best friends, and he introduced me to Vermilions. And he always said to me, don't baby the plants. He had a very thick European accent. He said, grow your plants tough. All right, enough. Go, go ahead, Ken. I'm sorry. Ken? 
Um, I wasn't Ooh. like anything particular, say uh, the Julieta, right? Yeah, this is Julieta. So it's, Julieta is actually named for the wife of one of my growers. Oh. Uh, and uh, she's from she's from Ecuador. So, wow. Uh, and uh, soon it was the grower and he helped um, do a lot. He did a lot of the propagation, the initial propagation on this after I. Uh, what, how big is this? What's the diameter? About six foot in diameter. So I was going to say, it fools, it can fool you a little bit because it starts to look like an Alcataria. Oh, it is. is. Well, it's uh, a Vericantria. Uh, oh, it is a Vericantria. Okay. It's, it's, yeah. it's a, it's a bi, uh, uh, yeah, double plant. Yeah. <laughs> bi generic. Bi generic. Yep. Yeah. I'm dingy today. But it, 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 and it's all purple or is it all sort of in a color? What, what would you describe? Well, the I, I would call it purplish. You know, uh, mine, mine have more purple on the leaves. Here's more in the central part. Um, is that is that because it's getting more sun than mine? Well, you know, every the climate is variable depending on where you are. This was uh, grown in Hilo at a thousand feet. Wow. And, uh, and our rainfall there, our average rainfall was 180 inches a year. So uh, we had a uh, unique climate and combined with it's on the side of Mauna Kea, almost 14,000 foot mountain. And so every night we would get a cold breeze that would come down from the mountain. So we had very unique conditions there. And it looks different now that I live in Waimanalo at 300 feet of elevation with no mountains behind me to speak of, well, 800 feet, but that's nothing. Uh, you know, mine are more purple and they don't have that glaucous sheen to them. Uh, so they, it changes. They change according to your climate. Yeah. Well, so you're saying it changed because you're in a warmer, you're I'm in a warmer, a warmer spot. drier spot. Yeah. Yeah. So what so, would the, different, the average temperature be there at sea level versus at a thousand feet? There's a drop. Uh, well, in Hilo, our, our coldest night ever was 49 degrees. Uh, uh, that was our winter historic low. Uh, but we would get, you know, maybe a 20 degree temperature drop every night uh -huh. um, with the mountain air. At sea level here, now uh, my low winter temperature is 55, and I don't think we've hit that in the last couple of years. And it's a 30 degree spread during the day? Uh, well, that's that's our historic low temperature. Wintertime temperature, you know, mostly is about 80 degree daytime and 70, 65, 70 nighttime temperature. So so, there's about a net 10 degree difference. 10, 15 degrees. And up on the mountain. Yeah. yeah. And uh, in Hilo, it was a it was more significant because we had that, you know, cold breeze draining off the mountain. Yeah, gotcha. Listen, I, 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 I want to break in because I'm itching to get to David's video and may, I want to make sure it plays. We're getting such a good recording here and want to make sure it plays for us. Hi, my name's David and I'm a plantaholic. I'm here in my garden today at Fantastic Gardens to show you some of my hybrids and selections. Um, we're growing these in full sun and we've discovered a lot of our plants tolerate this climate very nicely. That's not the case for everywhere. Uh, in California or Florida, they will probably burn in the sun, and certainly in Australia. Uh, but here they do quite well and so I'll introduce you to some of these guys. This is Hawaiian raspberry, which is a medium-sized growing plant with a spreading habit and gets this wonderful uh, raspberry color in the sun. This is my El Dorado, uh, a beautiful variegated uh, Varicia. Obviously, both of these have hieroglyphica in them, which I've used extensively as a parent. Uh, this gets wonderful uh, 
red glyphs in the sun. Also uh, a medium size but slightly bigger than the Hawaiian raspberry and spreading habit. To the left of El Dorado and in the front is pink herringbone which is, I would consider that a large medium plant. Uh, it's almost a large plant, but not quite. And that also gets wonderful pink color in the sun, and it's also very nice in the shade house. To my far left and back is the original herringbone, which out here in the sun, and this is the first we, the year we've tried it in the sun, gets a very rich color, as you can see, and the glyphs are quite herringbone pattern. We'll move around the garden and then into the shade house for some additional plants. All right, here we are at a different position in the garden. I'm right in front of me is my cool moss, which as you can see is quite a vigorous grower and free pupping. Um, slightly pink underneath the beautiful white and green uh, vigorous grower. It would be a medium size, right in the center of medium size Varicius with a spreading habit. To my far right and in the foreground is one of my, actually my oldest or first Varicia, variegated Varicia that I ever had. And that one is named Tulip. And that is quite, uh, I would call that a small, medium, or a large, small growing Varicia. And it is quite vigorous, uh, very, quite stable, and produces a lot of pups. It also seems to be one of the stronger ones for higher light situations. Back here, we have Uncle Bob, which is a beautiful uh, lineated uh, plant that gets excellent color, has nice purple fingertips, and this gets to be a large medium with a semi-spreading habit. Uh, I, a long time ago, I used a very upright vase-shaped uh, Varicia fosteriana rubra, and that gave a lot of my plants a very upright habit. To my left is another one of, uh, I forget, I think I registered this last year or the year before. This is one of the, it's a, this is full size. Uh, it doesn't really get much bigger, if at all. It gets wonderful hot pink color, and that's pink magic. So we have tulip, cool moss, Uncle Bob, and pink magic here. Pink magic also, uh, strong plant, free pupping. A uh, very good plant and does well in our conditions in high light. The last three plants in our garden area, in this part, portion of the garden area, and this is a new garden. These, the bromeliads have only been planted out for six months or so, and the entire garden is relatively new. Uh, we started it a year ago, April. So we're all, we're learning what we can do and what we can't do and uh, how the plants will uh, adapt out here under these conditions. In front of me on my left side is my Cosmic Cori, which is a medium to small, large, upright growing plant, excellent variegation, relatively stable, particularly stable. I see there's three pups on this side of it that I can see right now, and all of them are nicely variegated. So I'd say pretty stable, great plant, lots of color. To my right in the foreground is a strawberry sorbet, which as you can see, this is the first we've tried it in the sun, and it's adapted quite nicely and gets really nice strawberry color. So I think this is a good garden plant and all of these do equally well in the shade. You just get a little bit higher color in the sun. The plant to my right rear is an unregistered plant. Uh, I wanted to try it out here in the sun. This one uh, 
I'll be taking registration pictures in the very near future and submitting it. And I haven't come up with a name yet. This is um, the largest growing varicea that I've ever had. Uh, it's got hieroglyphic and a bunch of other things in it. It gets to be about six feet across. So it is a large, large varicea. Spreading habit, beautiful plant. I, it's getting a nice pink color here in the sun, but I think uh, it shows up a little bit better in the shade. In the shade, it's um, a nice yellow and green. Green glyphs on a yellow, yellowish leaf. So quite an attractive plant, but I think a little better in the shade, and we'll see it in the shade house a little bit later today. Strawberry ice cream is, I would characterize this as a spreading plant and the a large medium. So we have a large, a large medium, and a large, large here. This is the last area of the outdoor garden we'll talk about this afternoon. I wanted to show you um, a relatively new registration. Uh, this is a marginated version of our Talansia, well it was Talansia, now Willisia cyanea. This is Pink Magic, excuse me, this is Sandy's Candy. Uh, our original Talansia that I selected was Sandy, and then we have Sandy's Candy. And this gets, you know, wonderful blue flowers that are wonderfully fragrant. If you've never grown uh, Cyaneas, I would recommend it because the fragrance is just delicious. Out here in the sun, you can see the color gets very intense, very red. It's different in the shade, and we'll see this in the shade as well. Uh, we'll shoot one more video or so in the shade house, and you can see the difference in color between uh, shade grown and higher light grown. Behind Sandy's Candy is Neo Regilia Pink Magic. This, uh, we have it set back under the tree because it really doesn't care for the full sun. So it, it'll tolerate it, it won't die, but it bleaches out and it's not near as nice and the color is not near as intense. So, Sandy's Candy, pink, Neo Pink Magic, Willisia Neo Regilia. We're in the shade house now, and underneath 45% shade cloth, and I wanted to show you the difference uh, between the sun-grown material and material grown in some shade. Uh, this is not my deepest shade. I grow a lot of things in 73% as well. And we just see where things do best. So this is the plant that gets to be six feet across. And you can see it has a much uh, richer, in my opinion, color than in the sun. There is more definition in the leaf between the background and the glyphs. And I like it better in the shade than I do in the sun. In the front here is pink herringbone, and you can see it's not quite as intensely pink as it is in the sun. To my right rear is strawberry sorbet, and you can see very similar, but not quite the intensity that it get, achieves in the sun. Back here to my uh, left rear, is a recent registration. This is Elcantorea golden boy. It's a glazioana. I grew out a lot of glazioana seeds and found a variegated, partially variegated plant. And after it flowered and pupped, I got nice variegated uh, progeny from it. Good size, gets to be about the same as this plant. Um, very rich, broad leaves as a mature plant. It's broad-leafed and very rich color. Quite a nice specimen for the garden, I think. Um, yeah, very similar to John Stoddard, but I think John Stoddard has a more narrow leaf than uh, Golden Boy.
here we are in the shade house again where I wanted to show you the difference between Sandy's candy growing in the sun and Sandy's candy growing in the shade. As you can see, it's still marginated, still has some pink tint to the margins, but it's not near as red as the plants that were growing in the sun. The other difference is, uh, like many bromeliads, the more you feed it, the green it will be. So these have had a recent top dress uh, at transplant, well, I, when I stuck the cuttings. So they're pumped up with fertilizer, but still doing quite nicely. Now, first there was Sandy, which was a seedling selection from a cultivar called Anita. And then there was Sandy's Candy. And now there's also Sandy 2, spelled T-O-O as in also because uh, and this is also a wonderful variegated plant truly variegated but doesn't do quite as well in the sun as the sandy's candy in the foreground here we have a currently unregistered plant but i plan to register this in the near future as rainbow uh, this is a hybrid it's not a sport it's a hybrid as this came out just in this form as a seedling. So uh, many, some of my plants are sports and many of them are hybrids. Here we are out in the, the shade house again under 45% shade. And this is the last of this series of videos, and what I wanted to show you here was my rooting bench. This is where I root all my pups, and this is kind of the stuff that I send out about this size. Uh, I like to send well-established material. This is one of my newer hybrids and uh, selections, and this is Pale Rider. Now, what I do different here is I take the pups and I drop them right into an empty container and put them on this bench, and they do quite well. This is a recent addition to this bench, and I'm sure you can't see it, but it's already rooting quite nicely. They do so well out here that they will even get to mature size and flower. So it's very productive, and you can see they'll form a root system that will follow the contours of the pot and they do very nicely. So you may want to try this at home if you have difficulty rooting plants. I do it for, it's simple, it's quick, and then if for some reason I have a failure of the pup and it dies, I never potted it, I never wasted the medium. So it's also more economical for me to do it this way. The only care they get on this bench is they get watered once a day for a few minutes, just basically an overhead water, just to keep water in the cup and keep the humidity up, get a little bit of water into the pot so that the roots stay moist. Other than that, they get treated just the same as everybody else in this shade house. And that means they get a foliar feed twice a week. Just because they're pups, I don't stop feeding them. They seem to do quite well. Let me make one correction. I used to feed twice a week. Now I'm only feeding once a week because I believe it makes the plants a little bit tougher and a little bit uh, better survival characteristics if they're going to uh, very hot areas. So foliar feed once a week, mist once a day, easy breezy. Thanks a lot. Uh, if you want to visit me and look at the plants, you're welcome. Uh, just give me a call. My number's in the book. Uh, I'm on the membership roster of the Bromeliad Society. You can reach me any number of ways. Thanks a lot. Have a great day. Happy growing. David, thank you for the videos. They were incredible. And it generated a few questions um, that I had. I, I, I noticed that when you mentioned you water once a day, you have overhead sprinklers. Is that how you water most of your shade cloth plants was with the overhead sprinklers? Yes, yeah, we have a, a low flow 
system uh, where we run, it actually runs for an hour at a time. Um, uh, for the bromeliads, they get uh, a full irrigation, an hour irrigation twice a week. And they get full year fed for, you know, five minutes or so overhead twice a week as well. But that's just enough to get a little water in the cups. It's nothing gets reaches the pot in that full year feed. Okay. Now, I also noticed that in your garden, you had the varicias in large pots and in your shade area, you have some kind of a wire mesh off the ground that your plants are set on? Well, I, I have multiple areas, you know, and I have five benches of that wire mesh where six inch pots will drop in. And then the rest of the nursery is just, uh, it's wire bench with one inch holes. Are so, you trying to maintain airflow? Well, a wire bench is last way longer than wood. Um, way easier to clean. It's much more sanitary, it's cleaner, better airflow, and lasts longer. I, I was also wondering, can you say there's an average amount of pups on your plants? I, you mentioned uh, you know, there's pupping well. Like how many pups would you get from an individual plant in general? Uh, truth is I've never really counted them. Uh, and it all depends if I've stabbed it or the, the pups just come naturally. If they just come naturally, you know, uh, and they haven't flowered, they'll just keep making pups. Uh, if I stab them, you know, uh, three, four, five, six, there really isn't an average. So when you stab them, you're going to get more pups and you stab them before it blooms. Correct. It's done before blooming. And the benefit of stabbing is you get, you get them all at once or close to all at once, as opposed to if you don't stab and they just grow naturally, you'll get, you know, they'll come sequentially. They won't come all at once. For, for, for our audience that isn't, familiar with propagation techniques before they think we're murdering plants. Tell us what stabbing means. Well, I have a, uh, a, a flathead screwdriver that's about two feet long. And I take that and I put it right into the center of the plant and uh, stab it down and destroy the growing point. Of the plant. This is, this is the area where there's the monoclonal cells that are the growing apex of the plant, correct? It's the, you know, yeah, you, what we're doing is yeah. killing the undifferentiated growing point before yeah. it makes leaves or anything. Right. Uh, we want to kill that. And then what happens is the axle plants are mostly apically dominant. The the topmost growing point is the dominant growing point, and that keeps the uh, axillary buds from growing for the most part. So you destroy that, and then all the axillary buds can just, you know, uh, grow all at once. Right. The side, the side monoclonal. The side buds, yeah. Yeah, side buds. Sorry. Now, do you, do you come up with all the names yourself, or how do you come up with these names? Sometimes people suggest them and sometimes I just, mostly I just make them up, you know, based okay. on, you know, what does it look like to me? And this one looked like guava chiffon. So it's a very guava <laughs> colored and, you know, just seemed like uh, guava chiffon just seemed like its name. Oh, now you're getting me hungry for dessert. <laughs> I have one in my collection and I just love it. The, the striations and the colors and the, the tips of the leaves are just really beautiful. Yeah. I think it's a nice, it's a nice plant. I like this one. Beautiful. And you know, one, one second, I like the way that as it, the light color in the leaves uh, builds as it approaches the center of the cup. Mm -hmm. Okay, onto this one. 
this is a uh, flying tiger, real strong, real upright, broadleaf, variegated, slightly variegated plant. It's, uh, but real strong, very strong. And the underside of the leaves are gorgeous. Okay, this is uh, raspberry sorbet. Beautiful. I want two scoops. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm kind of food centric, so there's a lot of food <laughs> names out there like chocolate raspberry, raspberry sorbet, strawberry sorbet. I, I'm ice cream centric too. Very good. Yeah, I, I have your strawberry ice cream. Yeah, that's a, that's a nice plant. Very nice. I like I like these dark plants uh, and the high contrast. It's beautiful. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, this is uh, uh, now this is Gudia, uh, Ospinea. This is Gudia Ospinea variety Hawaiian Magic, which is a seedling selection I made from just Ospinea gruberi, and this was. This is different because it has a white background on the leaf. But Ospinaeas and the Gruberize are industrial strength plants, great plants, thick leaf, real sun, shade, doesn't care. So the more mature leaves, the newer ones have the white and the, and the I'm sorry, and the older ones are go from green to the white as it matures. Yeah, they deepen as they mature. And this is also variable depending on the light level. But this has superior uh, form and superior conformation. It's, it's way nicer than a lot of the, what you might call species, Ospinae Gubrides. That, that's a stunning plant. Yeah, this that was a, a real nice one. Well, I included this uh, because when I, Varicias, you their flowers open in the evening, in the early evening, and I'd have to get out there early, uh, just as it was getting dark, because when the after the flowers would open, the geckos would come out, and they'd want to crawl inside the flower to drink the nectar at the base of the flower, and they'd pollinate them if I didn't get there first. So I'd go out there first, and I'd rip the anthers out of the flowers so that. The geckos couldn't pollinate them. Do you have any other issues with any other kinds of pests like scale or mealy bugs or um, how, how do you maintain healthy plants? Well, uh, we have your at actually Hawaii has two pest seasons. Nematodes. Oh. Well, we have a high pest season and we have a higher pest season. Oh. <laughs> uh, so, uh, scale is the most common problem with the bromeliads here. Mealybugs, not so much, but scale is a real problem. Uh, snails. Black, black scale, or do you have the brown scale? or? Oh, uh, we have every kind of scale you can imagine. Okay. <laughs> uh, the other thing, you know, I've also had problems. We have a, uh, a really vile insect called banana moth that makes a larva that will borrow, burrow into the plants. Uh, and that's a horrible pest, but not hard to, you know, I've been spraying a chemical called Tallstar, which is a synthetic pyrethrin, and that works really well. And uh, since I've started using that, I haven't seen any of the banana moth at all, or ants for that matter. What's the name of that again? Tallstar, T-A-L-S-T-A-R. Let me, uh, David, let me ask you, so... Kind of a commercial question here. If people want to order from you, uh, shipping Hawaii to the mainland, does that involve a phytosanitary or not? No, uh, we're a state. Uh, yeah. But, but now, Hawaii is a island. special state and there are special restrictions. Yeah. But phyto and is not required. It is required to do it legitimately. Uh, you either have to have your plants inspected at Department of Agriculture or have a certified nursery. So I'm, my nursery is certified nematode free. So gotcha. I have my own stamp. And so I can just box things up, stamp them and ship them. Not yeah. a problem. And anytime you have an island biosphere, an island uh, environment, 
usually there are restrictions. Mm -hmm. Okay, on to what we're what are we what are we looking at here? This is uh, this is one of the my plants with the nicest confirmation. This is uh, jade lotus, and uh, it's you know a, basically a green plant, but really nice broad leaves and a great form on it. Um, this is one I'd like to continue to work with and keep this form and get some more color into it. So it's on, on the list of hybrid projects for the future for me. As a parent plant. As a parent plant. I like this as it is too. I think it's, too. it's a real nice plant. And it's, you know, I had another one that I registered is uh, Jade Jewel. Uh, but it, J. Jewel was twice as big as this one. So wow. this, this is, this only gets to be about 24 to 30 inches in diameter. So it's not that big a plant. So un unfortunately, I worked with big plants um, thinking when I started hybridizing, I was growing for the commercial Hawaiian market and landscape. So right. Big translated to faster speed of growth. So that's where I focused. And I wish I had spent the last 20 years doing smaller plants, but yes. that's life. Well, you're going to leave a legacy that's extraordinary. But the, the better choice for a quick profit would have been smaller plants. Yeah. Uh, Nonetheless, well, I did this mostly for me anyway. So Right, right. Oh, my God. Look at this. Yeah, what this, is that? This is Luscious Lady, which also has excellent form. Another yeah. one of the ones with really excellent form. Beautiful. Yeah, mine's growing really well. So, which we were talking previously about growing your plants in different locations in the United States and some parts of California, you wouldn't be able to. They're too cold. There's not enough humidity, but living near the ocean here and under uh, screen, mine does very well, but yours are flawless. Look look at the leaves, there's not a mark on them and they're just uh, so colorful, beautiful. That's that's basically selection. Not all my plants are, are this nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, this wow. is... Yeah, this is uh, El Dorado grown in the shade house and oh. and photographing from the top down on the Varicias really, you really get the best view. So it's, it's a really nicely colored plant and it's won awards for a lot of people around the world. What's interesting, I agree, looking down is fantastic, but the underside of many of you, if you're... Really oh, oh, absolutely. Or it's a whole different picture. Yeah. I, it's just because on Facebook, David almost always includes the underleaf side view of his plants when he posts photos yeah. of his plants. I, I like the upskirt shots on the Varicia. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, for a presentation like this, these are the kind of photos we want. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This looks really good like this. And how big does that get? El Dorado is another medium, you know, 24 to 30 inches. Okay. But, but beautiful. So, yeah. It's pretty stable. Wow. Yeah. That's that one pops. Yeah. Beautiful. High contrast. Yeah. The yeah. contrast of the colors and the glyphs are just, and the, the leaves with that additional light purple around the edges. Wow. Yep. What's this called? This is wine raspberry. Oh, this wine is, raspberry. I, li I like this one a lot. It, it really pops. The colors pop. It's got nice confirmation, too. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, your, ra your chocolate and Hawaiian, your raspberries are gorgeous. This is a recent uh, addition to Abbey Road. <laughs> so that's. Uh, just needed a name. Abbey Rhodes was rattling around in my brain, so that's what it got. I, I wondered how you got that. Well, it's funny because the, the green glyph center looks like a road and the album origination looks like sidewalks. 
Oh, there you go. Abbey Road. All right. But that's a, uh, oh my God. Now this is, this is Tulip. This is uh, the first, uh, this one's marginated, but the first variegated Varese I ever grew. Wow. Uh, one of my seedlings. And uh, it's, and it's, this is one that has held up through the test of time. So this I probably made in, you know, the mid nineties, somewhere around there. So, so this yeah. might be a third or fourth pup generation then? Oh, is that the plan? Or tenth, tenth generation. <laughs> okay. I, this one, it's been through a lot of, lot of pups. I've, this one does very well. Pretty stable and pretty durable and tough. Yeah, it's substantially smaller than many of your others, but it's a nice compact. I mean, it's nice as any of them. Oh, yeah. I like this one. I like it because it's small, too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Now, this one is named after my daughter. Uh, this is Jamie Smithy. Uh, wow. Yeah, I, I this need is... to reach over and put my socks back on. It knocks my socks off. It's yep. so gorgeous. Yeah, it's, this is a very pretty plant. Stunning. Yeah, this is medium size. You know, 30 to 36 inches, pretty, you know, it's a semi-upright. It's a little bit more upright than like Tulip is a, just a spreading one, but this has got some of that rubra genes in it. Yeah. You know, but, but this just the, the scales we're talking about when we get to the glyphoresias are so significantly bigger that when you say medium or even small, large, these plants are you know, four times the size of most your Julius. You know, we were pleasant. I like it. We were talking earlier, Barry made the comment that, you know, we've all been raising these bromelias for 50 years or more. And when I got into it in the 60s, there were more species and nothing like this existed. And over the years, I've transitioned out of species more into the hybrids now. That's why I mentioned that I have a separate David Fell section and a separate Chester Skotak section in my garden. And indeed, this is the way the market has gone, obviously. Uh, well, it's also the way the breeders have gone. What I yeah. selected, you know, in the 90s and the early 2000s, now I would probably throw away. Uh, because the bar has just, you know, gotten so much higher than it was. Wow. Yep. Chocolate glyphs. I like this one. Yeah. This is, uh, you know, this is one I was unsure of whether I wanted to register it or keep it or not, but I decided to keep it. It's, it's a nice chocolatey color. You know, it's like a chocolate hieroglyphica. Very nice. But when I see when I see the skinnier leaves and separate like that, I want to say gutata or lingulata or is there any of that in there? No. No. Okay. No. I'm full on wrong. You know, I used a lot of Nova. I used Nova, Fosteriana. You know, I had well four or five different clones of Fosteriana. Oh, uh, okay. So, and I've used all of them at one time yeah. or another, hieroglyphica. So the primary parents in my crosses of species were um, Gigantia nova, hieroglyphica, yeah. and Fosteriana. Those yeah, constituted see, the majority of them. I see the Fosteriana in a lot of the plants. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. So this is, uh, I have another plant. This is, uh, let's see, this was, okay, Pink Dreams came first, and this is Pink Delight. Pink Dreams is a, has the same color pattern. It's the same color palette with uh, pink margins, but uh, that one is very upright, and this one is a spreading type. So this is a 36 inch diameter job. Uh, so it's, a, it's 
on the large side. I would call this a large. Uh, nice, nice plant. Seems <laughs> stable. Did you stab this one? No, no. I at this point, I seldom stab things. What do you, I'm sorry. When you say stable, you're saying it it passes on the album margination easily. Correct. You know, and, yeah. you know some of some of the plants, uh, the pups. Yeah. Some, you know, a lot of times you'll get green pups, all green. Yeah, pups. Re this one is pretty stable, and the marginations are passed on to the majority, the vast majority of the pups. So if any of them were all green, would they at a later time possibly show the old, the, the uh, Alba Marginata later on, or is it gone once it's... Well, it's possible, but uh, if I get a green pup, it's going in the bin. Yeah, it's, not know, likely. It's going in the compost. Yep. Stunning plant. Wow. This, no, this looks like a, a large, large. Well, you know? this is a good size plant. It's a large. It's an up, it's an upright. This is Hawaiian fantasy. And this truthfully is a little bleached out. The color is a yeah. little bit richer than than is shown in this this photograph, but it's a great plant. Beautiful. Yeah. Now that just was, wow. just a word on uh, pups, I've gotten uh, my uh, Pink Dreams, which is a pink marginated one, came out of a yellow variegated mother plant. Wow. So it, it appeared as a sport on a yellow variegated plant. So I've had multiple sports from one plant go off and become entirely new cultivars. Wow. Very interesting. Ken, let me just ask you, how many more photos are there? This is the last one. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, we should show Golden Boy, which we didn't see that on the this. Is it in uh, it? Are they at the part of the list? Oh, yeah, it's, it's in that section. There you oh. go. That's Golden Boy. Oh, yeah. So that shows up you know, this is a more mature plant uh, than I had in the shade house. And this gives a, a better impression of it. You know, and this one is not full size, but it's close. This is about four feet in diameter or so. Very nice. Is that a Cantria or a... This is a El Cantria a Glaziawana. That's what I thought. Yeah, just straight Glaziawana, which is a wonderful plant. I love the species. Beautiful yeah, this, snow white flowers that are fragrant. This is a significantly more attractive plant due to the conformation, the form, yeah. the yeah, banding. Beautiful. So. Beautiful. Um, beautiful. I, I scrolled through a few earlier that you may not have talked about. Um, yeah, this is Chartreuse Goose, another recent registration. You know, recent, the last... 14 months. Uh, that's recent to me. Uh, so this yeah. is a recent medium-sized plant. Pretty nice. Stable. Good plant. Are those marrows down at the very bottom? It's oh, yeah. That's all I wear. <laughs> no, that's that's my stand. Go to a shoe. Another similarity. Really, yeah. really. So what's, what's your background educationally in the plant world? Uh, I have a degree in horticulture. I have an undergraduate degree in horticulture that I got. Oh. I graduated in 79 after 13 years of uh, on and off going to college. <laughs> but, uh, but it paid off eventually. I, I had a very good time. Yep. <laughs> Can I assume that you sell worldwide? Uh, I hate shipping international, but uh, my plants have made it around in various places. I take plants when I go to Thailand, I, I take plants and there's a few collectors there that uh, get my stuff and some of them make their way to Taiwan. So I have uh, some folks in Taiwan that appreciate them. So love well, to see, I'd love to see them move around the world.
the plants, the bromeliads now are hitting their apex in Southeast Asia. Of course, Talanzias have eclipsed everything else. Mm-hmm. It, it's just so huge. You know, it's like 100,000 websites now that sell them. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I would say that when this is presented to our Bromeliad Society, the La Bologna Valley Bromeliad Society, that we will have our members very, very excited to see this and enjoy it. And hopefully your plants will be spread into some of their gardens as well and make them fantastic gardens. And, and I will be putting a title board at the end, like you said, with your email and nursery name. So they'll, they'll, they'll figure out how to reach you. Okay. Cool and, you know, this will go onto the YouTube channel and theoretically you'll be seen around the world. I don't think it's theoretical. Yeah, you know, our, our best uh, video, the, the uh, Zoom we did, I think it was either Pedro or Chester, has like 1,500 views, which isn't bad for a bromeliad, you know, I video. Like yeah. 500 for them. You know, it's, it's no dancing baby at 10 million views, but <laughs> <laughs> YouTube is so unpredictable. But anyways, it's, it's, it's an outreach. And that's what you and I can, you know, after our 50 years of being interested, growing the plants, loving the plants, it's our turn now to reach out to other people, to young people, and to say, hey, these are the, one of the best, most incredible family of plants on earth, and they're worth growing. So I want to thank you very much, David, for agreeing well, to do this and shooting the videos and everything else. I wish someday I could come visit you, but it probably won't happen. Well, but at least now, at least now I feel like I've been to the nursery. Well, you know, <laughs> the, the closest you can get to Hawaii is stopping at my house, and you'll be able to see yeah. some of his fantastic plants. Well, yep. I appreciate your work, Ken. You're doing a good job. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so All right. this, this section here is a general Varicia section, but in the other side of my yard is like just yours. Like I think I have about 25 of them. Just Are you referring to the photo behind you? Yeah, the photo behind me is one of the sections of my yard that isn't, it's, it's, they're not all his. Um, yeah, but I get it. But a yeah, bunch of those other days. Another one that's just his plants only. But a bunch of those are David's behind you. Yeah, it's just this one, Varicia uh, strawberry ice cream. Okay. But none of those other ones are. I um, maybe um, this is a shigi back here and down here. All right. Um, this I don't know. This might be one of yours behind my right shoulder here. Yeah, that could be. Yeah. All right. We but, get the idea. Yeah. Well, I. Uh... I, I didn't have time in my life to en- end up growing many of the glyphorizias, but I've always admired them a lot at a distance. And uh, eventually we're going to probably do another Zoom with uh, Jacob Coning of Australia, maybe George Stamatis. Mm-hmm. These are some of your compatriots in the glyphorizia hybridizing world. So who knows? We might invite you back as a commentator on those videos. Okay. Uh, I'll give, obviously give you a lot of notice.